Well, joining us now, Michael McKinson, who has been, I don't say elevated even, he's got his rank at number four in the WBO, and he's got a massive fight in America uh, coming up in March against uh, Virgil Ortiz, who's tipped to be one of the hottest prospects uh, in the sport. But you are actually training at the moment with one of the hottest kind of fighters in the sport, in Josh Taylor. So you're getting your good practice in, Michael. Uh, yeah, I'm up here for a couple of days uh, sparring him, helping him out, and that is great experience for me. Um, just even watching him train, do you know what I mean? So it's all good. Uh, yeah, it's been a crazy, crazy 12 months. If you think back to where I was 12 months ago, I was it was before I got the call for Chris Congo fight. Mm. I was like, where am I going to get my shot on the big stage? And fast forward 12 months, not only that, not only getting signed to match room, fighting on a pay-per-view card, fighting on a fight camp. Now I'm headlining in America. So, as they say, trust the process. But uh, I'm, on number four. I'm on number four with the WBR. I thought I was number three. Joe, well, sorry, I probably got it wrong then. Yes, you, you. well, I've got you down as four, but maybe it's three. I apologise. I, I haven't checked it in a month. I haven't checked it in a month, so who I, knows. I tell you what is, Sean Porter was originally ahead of you, but he's retired, hasn't he? Right, OK, that's what it is then. You've moved up one. Um, yeah, that's trust, it. trust the process. That's it. That's um, it. MTK, MTK have done a, a great job with me over the last couple of years and securing me good opportunities. And and slowly but surely, I've worked my way up in WBO rankings and earned, not only got given, I've earned the shot to, to fight Virgil Ortiz. So, yeah, it all smiles, my end. Well, um, you know, there's only Mikey Garcia and Virgil Ortiz ahead of you with obviously the champion Terence Crawford there at, uh, at the top of the table. Um, the fascinating thing about you, I was going to mention the Chris Congo fight, really, because that was the moment that you definitely came to greater prominence with the British public, with the boxing world. Um, you went in there with the attitude as people are underrating me and I'm going to shock everyone, didn't you? Yeah, do you know, with me, especially by the time it's fight night after a camp, mentally I'm so solid um, and a lot of people could have crumbled under that Congo uh, fight. Everybody writing you off, all the boxing experts thinking he'd knock me out, whatever it may be. Fighting him as the B-side on a Dillian White undercard, who was his manager. People would have crumbled under that, but me, I'm different than the rest. And I think a lot of my strength comes mentally. Uh, I'm mentally bulletproof come fight night and this fight will be no different. Yeah, I'm aware I've got a mountain to climb. I'm aware I'm fighting a, a guy that's tipped for stardom um, on a golden boy cut. I'm fighting golden boys, golden boy. Exactly. So, um, so but I'm not, I'm a realist, but you know what? My mindset's so strong and, you know, I really do believe in my capabilities and, you know, I know I'm good. Every day in camp, is I'm getting more and more confident I'm going to go there and, and and shock everybody. When will you go there? Are you going 10 days in advance for time difference? Yeah, most probably, but um, there's no location yet. So once we know location, at the moment, my dad's in charge. Whatever he says goes. Um, it's not my choice. So whenever he wants me to go out there, I'll go out there. Um, but as soon as we get a location... <laughs> like we can start planning what we're going to do obviously he's from texas but what would you what would you like would you like a vegas fight would you like a, a los angeles fight is there somewhere in your mind you'd love to go no for me like i know it's looking a massive occasion fighting in america and a lot of people dream of it but it's a job at the end of the day so i'm not gonna enjoy if it's in enjoy it any more or any less if it's in Vegas or I'm not going to enjoy it any less if it's in somewhere no one fights. So um, for me, I know it's a big occasion. I know the American people, it's going to be hostile. I know it's going to be hostile, but they're going to love me in the end. I know, I know they are. One of the things I've got to say about your career, obviously back to 2018, you fought Kevin McCauley, who I think went in with a 15 wins, 169 losses and 12 draws. Since then, what people haven't noticed is Sammy McNess had only lost once in 11. Ryan Kelly had lost once in 14. 
Um, uh, Evgeny Pavko had lost twice in 20. Luis Alberto Verón was unbeaten. Martin Harkin was unbeaten. Chris Congo was unbeaten. People should have noticed something about that growing record of you because you've got skills to pay the bills. My, yeah, that's you. So you've just reeled off my last seven, and obviously my last opponent was nineteen and one. Nineteen and so one as well. I was going to mention Ranovsky as well. Yeah, yeah, nineteen and one. So, so my last seven have a combined record of one hundred and four wins and five losses. Yeah, my last four have a combined record of fifty-one wins and one loss. So, like, I have gone under the radar really because it it'll be tough to try and get a British fighter. The British welterweight that's got statistics like that. Um, so I have gone under the radar. Like I said, everything is earned, not given. I've had to do it a lot harder than most others. But it's rewarded now. I've got the opportunity of a lifetime now, not just to change my life, but to change my future. So winning this can really do great things for me and my family. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fully motivated, fully focused. This is my lottery ticket. This is my fight that's going to change my future. You mentioned your father, Michael. Obviously, he trains you. Tell us that your brother boxes as well, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, tell us about how you got into the sport. You're from Portsmouth, aren't you? How yeah. you got into the sport. And was dad influential in that? Yeah, sure. So, obviously, my dad being a boxing trainer and manager, um, we were boxing when we were in nappies like we like I, I knew my stance now to shape up from very young uh didn't have the best amateur career me and my brother we never won any national titles so we didn't have a head start in the professional game like I thought it'd be a lot easier than what it has been I thought when I was young I'm gonna be a professional boxer I'm gonna be straight on tv it just took a long time to get there funny funny enough actually it's crazy how like, the world goes around. Uh, when I was aspiring uh, Josh Taylor yesterday, my brother was sparring Chris Congo in the same gym. <laughs> so it, like, it's mad, isn't it? I fought Chris, what, nine months ago, ten months ago, and now my brother's sparring him and that. So, so yeah, we're a boxing family, so it's, like, it's always competitive in our family, especially between me and Lucas. Um, growing up, like, I, I don't think I'd probably be where I am without that brother, uh, brotherly competitive um, thing. So, uh, so yeah, it's always good. Um, like our, our childhood was a lot better and we were guided a, a lot better way than most others. So I'm really thankful that to be from a boxing family. Um, so, yeah, like it, not only is this, is this big for me, it's big for my family. We've took, like, I'm not somebody that's, had to move teams and adapted, had to change trainers and adapted. This has been from birth. So growing up, were you always watching fights with dad? Are you boxing aficionados as well? Did you excel at other sports as well? Uh, played a little bit of football when I was younger, as most kids do, but got to like probably an age where I had to pick one or the other and I was a lot better at boxing. But like, for me... My early memories in boxing is uh, my dad being around, like going to the Maloney shows and stuff when I was really young. I remember being backstage watching Johnny Tapia yeah. at, at York Hall, um, Ricky Atten as he was coming out at York Hall. Look, so I was, I've was i been about boxing my whole life. Um, going to being in the gym with Tony Oki when he was training, um, uh, like all the time going to the gym with him from probably about six, seven years old. Like, that's how young I was. Mm. So, for me, people that knew me when, it, when, um, when I was a kid, they knew I was only ever going to be one thing in life, and that was a professional boxer. It, like, my path was set from young. Um, like, there, there's been times which, I, like, I invested everything into boxing, and I maybe should have learned a trade after school. I, I maybe should have done better at school. There's been times where I thought, ah, wish I learned a trade after school. Because there's times I was so frustrated for a while with my boxing career, like, but now that don't matter. Now everything's worth it. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I'm I'm blessed. Uh, I'm in a great position. I've got a great opportunity. Um, and yeah, don't write me off. Don't write me off. 
Um, when you uh, came up with your nickname, was that you or your dad that came up with it? You're a southpaw, you're tricky, you're called the problem. Yeah, so I was training with professionals. Obviously, I was with my amateur gyms and stuff, but I was still training with the professionals in the professional gym with my dad um, from probably 14 years old, sparring men, sparring like 14, 15 years old. And my dad used to be like, but I had to develop that awkward style. I was always slick. I yeah. had to develop that awkward style because I didn't want to get hit by men. Mm. Like, I was thrown in with men from young and my dad used to say he's a problem, isn't he? And the pros used to say he's a problem. And that's this was before Adrian Broder. This, like, do you know what I mean? A lot of people would, like, would obviously guess that I, I got that nickname from Adrian Broder. But really, I was being called a problem before I knew who Adrian Broder was. So, look, um, March the 22nd, sorry, March the 19th, we don't know the exact venue yet. Um, Virgil Ortiz has been a problem for 18 opponents so far. What can you bring that's different against him? You know, he has been a problem, but he's also shown vulnerabilities. Yes. Oh, like, and really, there's never been a time, you look back at Mark fights and you think, oh, he, he didn't take that shot well, or he's looked vulnerable in that fight. That's... Like you can go through 21 fights. It's never been like that with me. Okay, he's fought at a higher level than me, but he's been tested. In that last fight, he was tested. He came through it. He's never fought anyone unbeaten. He's never So he's never fought anyone with the hunger and the drive that I've got and the confidence that I'm bringing all the way from the UK. Never. So I'm the biggest test for Virgil Ortiz. And that's what it is. Everyone's going, oh, okay, it's a big fight for me. It's massive for me. But it's a massive test, and I'm the banana skin for him. There's talk of him. There's talk of him fighting these top southpaws and the, like, the world champions and stuff. But it's my job not to let him get there. Well, we cannot wait to hear from you on several occasions in the lead up to that. It's great to see you, Michael. You look in great shape. Enjoy the Josh Brilliant. Taylor sparring. We'll catch up with you very soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much.